there's also some very unpleasant aspects of the immigration that was allowed from the Commonwealth, particularly from India and Pakistan, you know, in the 50s, that's causing, fuels this debate in a very unattractive way into the UKIP and the National Front and elements of UKIP, which, of course, is this whole question of Muslim, you know, and that's part of this difficulty, which doesn't get said as openly. Now, the answer to that, you know, it's shocking, you know, I think it's shocking, personally, that one of our government departments put out, I don't know whether you saw that, um, vans with a big sign on it saying, if you're Ill here illegally, go home. In, that, for the, for in England, that's a very shocking thing. To, I mean, they took them off after about a week. So you can see the political problem here, you know, and the nature of it. And I, I think, you, you know, to me, I, I think that's one where, where business... And whatever the facts, you, you, it seems very difficult to get them over. So the answer actually is get back to economic growth. That, that's part of it. Get the jobs back and the confidence back. And one area where possibly, you know, we, we in the UK have, 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 have not um, been smart enough is when you delve into some of the issues more precisely in some of the regions, there's been a big increase in jobs and growth, mainly uh, a lot through EU, Eastern Europe. And of course, what's happened is that there haven't been enough schools, primary schools, and uh, maternity places to deal with that population, which has a different level of, you know, production of children and so on than, the, than than in England. So there are some practical issues. But again, you know, you know this. We see this across the whole of Europe. Some very right-wing movements. You see this with Golden Dawn in Greece. This is a neo-Nazi group. There are some extreme right-wing groups in Germany. There are some extreme right in in Holland, uh, in France. Uh, it, it, and I think whenever you get a period of such downturn and instability, people become more nationalist. That's, let's face it, that's what happened in 1933. That's uh, in Germany. So I think we're all worried about this. This is why, um, you know, business, I think, more than people realize, you know, when politicians, you know, this last week, at the Labour, you know, about whether we have a people agenda or business, business has to have a people agenda because, you know, for business to survive and for capitalism in a sensible form to survive and even democracy to survive, you've got to be able to create jobs and growth. So I think we really have to work hard at this to sort of take away the blame. You know, everything in England gets blamed. It's either Brussels not true or it's immigration. Neither are true. But it's what, it is worrying and it's, it's, uh, it's worrying. Thank you. Very interesting. Now, um, any other questions? Please. Uh, Nicholas Smith, CLSA Securities. Um, bringing you back to the um, the points made on the uh, the flyer about this meeting to uh, to Abenomics. Obviously, in '79, the UK was something of a basket case, uh, and it had a, a big turnaround under Thatcher. I suppose the um, the bit related to the unions doesn't really apply to Japan. But if you were to pick three things that you you said these are, these are things that Japan could learn from um, uh, from the UK and under um, under the Thatcher reforms, what do you say that they are? Yeah. Again, I, I hesitate to, to come as a, as a foreigner to tell Japan how to run its country, but I, I think the lessons, if you put it to learn, which it seems to me Prime Minister Abe has in, in many measure, is you really got to have the courage, uh, you, you know, to make these very big changes, which he started with on monetary policy, you know, and, and fiscal issues. You've got to move on, as we talked about earlier, to uh, competitiveness and reform of restrictive practices, you've then got to have the courage to go through what will be a very difficult period. Um, you know, you, I, I can't remember what Prime Minister Abe's popularity, but when I say 70, was it seven, something very hard? Yeah, thereabouts in the 60s. 70, I, I read, you know, 70. You've got to expect that if the policies are going to work, you're going to drop to 20, 30% before it comes back. And it, it, as sore as the sun rises to me, that's the lesson. And what Margaret Thatcher did when even her closest ministers, and you could, you know, it's interesting the way people look at Margaret Thatcher now, some things people didn't like about her, you, you know, and poll tax and one or two other things, but actually if you, if you look at what she did achieve and made the breakthrough to the sclerosis that existed in the UK that never really, you know, from the end of the Second World War, it was a sclerotic society in every single respect, 
was even when her closest advisors lost their nerve, she didn't. And, I, and that's probably the thing you have to do because there's no easy way in a society of any sort that, that's used to a way in, of things being done and a, and a regulation or approach to jobs and labor, you know, that, that to change that is painful. I mean, that's very, very painful. And, and, but you have to be able to, to complete that aspect of it. And I think, you, you know, it is for Japan also as, as a large but aging population, you know, really engaging on the thing we touched upon is opening up. I, I think, you know, you know Doha is, is dead to all intents and purposes. So I think there's enormous opportunities on bilateral trade deals. And I think for Japan, you know, it's a very different country to many other parts of Asia Pacific. But I think those are critically important to really engage in, in a way that would help opening up markets, which will mean Japan having to open up too and making it easier. But there are big opportunities for Japan in that. And I, I really don't know, I mean, on the issue of population and aging a population, this also creates difficult questions about, uh, you know, immigration and availability of labor, um, you, you know, as the economy starts to grow. Thank you. Now, next question. Hopefully there'll be more, but um, I've got one to, um, to sort of slide in the middle here. Um, there was a, a brief period, uh, Sir Michael, where you had um, two uh, British CEOs in charge of companies here, uh, obviously Howard Stringer and, um, and then Mr Michael Woodford, who was a, a guest at the um, FCCJ here during a very um, yeah. turbulent time. I wanted to, know, um, to ask you, um, particularly relating, relating to the latter, Mr Woodford, um, what did his experience say about corporate governance in Japan and um, do you think British CEOs would be such as even, dare I say yourself, as a chairman, wish to come and work in Japan in a senior role given what happened in that case? Well, <laughs> listen, I mean, I, I have not gone into any detail into this particular case. Um, I, I would say that there is, a, 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 has been for some time a general view um, that governance in, in Japan could do with being more transparent. Um, you know, that's not to say that any particular country has the right to lecture in other on what constitutes uh, proper governments within their society. But prima facie in this particular case, uh, you know, and, and again, I don't know the details, it, it certainly seemed to develop in a way that was very surprising and the, the way that it's been handled seems to be very surprising. Uh, so I think it does cause concern. So I think from an inward investment and general efficiency point of view, it, I think it is very important that, that, that you know, one recognizes in today's world, as we were talking earlier about the instantaneous nature of availability of information, transparency of governance processes and dealing with the perception as well as the actuality of independence is really important. You know, how long people should be board members, how many independent board members there should be. And also it comes to, I think, that the question of diversity, I think, is hugely important. I think Prime Minister Abe is also trying to create more diversity. That works, by the way. We've had a lot of pressure in the UK to have more female members of boards. It works. I mean, all the studies academically show that diverse groups actually make better decisions from a, a you know, nationality, gender, you know, and background point of view. So I think, you know, one of the criticisms thrown at uh, the Conservative Party and its leadership is they all pretty much, you know, and there could be, not quite true, but nearly true, come from kind of one school and two universities, or two schools and two universities, and certainly one system of schools. So th that's not helpful. So I think in Japan, sometimes it's felt that it's a very close group within, within the run a board. The same criticism, by the way, has been thrown at American companies. Uh, so, so I think there is an issue here for, for, for reform of, of governance and transparency. Excellent. Now, uh, another question at the back. Uh, Furukawa, a long-time member and freelance. Uh, if you give me a few minutes for me to give you a story, 
back in 1960s, about 50 years ago, half century ago, your confederation sent a delegation to Japan for the first time after the war. A delegation made an extensive tour of Japan with visit to industrial plants, research centers, and for talks with government industry leaders. And the delegation was headed, if my memory serves me right, uh, the chairman of the Confederation at the time. I interviewed him in the lobby of uh, New Osaka Hotel, because I was a business editor of the Mainichi at the time. And we sat down, and I asked him, what do you think about Japan? And the first words he spoke to me, or he uttered to me, in reply to my question was, or, you are in a league, L-E-A-G-U-E. -E. For a moment, I couldn't understand what he meant by you are in a league, a baseball league or a football league. Then I learned that what he meant, well, Japan is in a league of industrial and advanced nations, like, um, such as Britain and the United States, despite the fact that Japan was still struggling to rehabilitate, rehabilitate and re re rebuild the uh, ruined country uh, from the ruins of the war. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, I would like to put this same open-end question to you today. What do you think of Japan, its government, its uh, economy and the industry, and in particular, it's a future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I think it, it's interesting that, that um, if you go back in history, the way in which both Germany and Japan recovered, you know, from the events of the Second World War and the huge damage and destruction to create in both cases fantastic industries, innovation, Toyota quality circles in Germany that led the world, actually you know, in terms of many areas, this was the engine of productivity and growth and innovation and set the trend for modern motor car manufacturing across the whole world, which the British, by the way, took a very long time to learn. So there's an interesting historical issue around how well these two countries did in, in spite of the, the damage that was done because of those events. And today I would say to you, you know, generally speaking, Japan is still seeing a very large country, a very large market, in a very important part of the world, with very great technology and engineering skills, have been seen as having become a bit sclerotic, you know, in dealing with uh, the, the post-crisis events. I mean, we're still, I seem to remember the Nikkei was at 40,000 at one stage. I think now it's, uh, what, 13,500, you know something? 14,000. 14,000. You know, so a lot happened that went wrong and, and, and became sclerotic, really, and, and started to lose competitive edge as others came into the game. But I, I think, generally speaking, um, people see uh, this, and it's not a political statement, but are absolutely, hence the investment, delighted to have seen the government wanting to say, right, we cannot continue with this sort of deflationary trends. We have to do something dramatically different which is a bit what Margaret Thatcher did, but in different circumstances, you have a better base. So I, I think dealing with these really fundamental issues of deficits, of um, aging population, of huge competition coming from the region and elsewhere, huge issues of energy cost and supply and security of supply, I think it's really, really, uh, you, you know, most people are really, really impressed. And I actually think this gives you, in Japan, part of that to, to be seen to be somewhere where people would want to invest or engage in because it looks like could be a country on the move. And I honestly believe, you know, and obviously we BT were heavily involved in the London Olympics. It was a fantastic success at every single level, you know, for investment, for confidence, for pride, you know, for the ICT. And I think for you, for you the Olympics will be a great event too and can be used as something that facilitates that. So, I mean, that, that's, that's how I would honestly say it. See it, please, yeah. Please. Yeah, 
Leipzig, for a little freelancer from Germany. Um, I think uh, if Mark, Maggie Thatcher could see what uh, Prime Minister Abe does now, this kind of uh, policy to spend a lot of money, I think she would not be happy with it. I think her, uh, her money policy was very different from his. So how do you see it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I referred, you know, the history of the two things is different. I, I was referring to her bravery in dealing with the issues that existed in the UK. The problem in the UK at the time, I think, was not just a question of fiscal trade deficit particularly per se. It was an issue of a completely sclerotic society where the trade unions dominated everything, where productivity was going downhill, where the nationalized industries were incredibly ineffective and inefficient, where um, the coal miners union particularly was holding the country to ransom, and she broke them. She then, and one of the criticisms that would be made is as the country quickly recovered, actually, and as the fiscal revenue started to come in, because she had the bravery to understand what's politically difficult, but of course, it's the Lafferty curve, and it works. You reduce the top rate of tax, you raise more tax. You reduce corporate tax rates, you raise more tax. What she didn't do, and I, I would, and I, uh, you know, I'm not a member of any political party, but if you, if you would, you know, to look at it, and when she died, there was a lot of analysis done, and I think a lot of people in the UK felt it, it made our current political leaders look very weak because two or three interesting things came out. One was, you know what? This woman was a leader. You know what? She believed in something. You know what? She said the same things in private as in public. And you know what? She made a difference. And it made everyone stand back. And all the popularity, because the, our, our current, I'm not individualizing it, look really weak in comparison. And then you get the analysis. And there were two analyses. One is you know, the, her, the issue with the poll tax, which people in England know was a sort of disastrous political issue. But the biggest criticism is actually she was determined to pay off the whole national debt. I mean, she had in mind it was that housekeeping, and she completely underinvested in infrastructure, which we're still suffering from today. So there's, there's a different. Whereas Japan has had the infrastructure, but the issue is how you move from different. The issues are different. I think the similarity is bravery to do something very different. That's, that would, would be, to me, uh, you know, the, 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 perhaps the, the, the point in, 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 in question. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Michael Brook. I'm an associate member. Um, in your very interesting speech, you used the word sclerotic quite a lot with respect to both the UK and, and Japan. And um, Japan is often perceived by observers as having not a terrifically entrepreneurial society. And you referred also to the, the rather lack of, or the, the uh, a lack or perceived lack of diversity in, in Japan um, in various different um, areas. My question to you is, um, did you s or have you observed um, an improvement in the sclerotic nature of society in general, but particularly in, in the area of business in the UK? over your career, particularly since Thatcher came um, into power and introduced the various things she did. And with respect to Japan, um, do you think there is scope for government to get involved in, in, in enhancing through various different programs a more entrepreneurial uh, environment in Japan? Yeah. Thank you. No, interesting. I mean, absolutely, you know, I think there's absolutely no doubt one of the, one of the major things Thatcher did by reducing uh, the tax burden. Don't forget, many people in the UK post-Second World War were paying 90, 95% tax rates, some year 108% tax rates were having massive inheritance tax duties. I mean, it was really, uh, you, you know, not healthy. What she did when she just unilaterally cut the top tax rate to 60% and then to 40% rapidly, and she just did it. She didn't, when the Treasury came along, told you, she just told them to get lost. She just said, we're going to do it. And you know what? It worked. I mean, it really worked. And it particularly works, what I wanted to get to. It created a whole generation of people say, it's worth working. It's worth working. And I think it's been fantastic. And more recently, you've seen, um, you know, there's been about a million jobs, as, as I think about, I can't remember the exact figures. I think it's seven, 800,000 people have been thrown out of, you know, state employees out of the bloated public sector. I mean, we had a GDP in the state sector close to Russia's. You know, I mean, it was, you know, historically... And it, a, a million jobs have been created. So I think there's no doubt that that created a different environment. And although 
everyone moans about regulation, which, which they blame Brussels and so on and so forth. People are willing to go out and get into business. It was very, just a little anecdote. I remember at Davos, um, we had a British business lunch, and George Osborne was there a couple of years, two years ago, and an, an, an SME guy got up and he said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm an SME, I'm not a big sophisticated company, uh, you know, I employ 200 people. So this is how I see it, he said. So I pay 20% uh, VAT on everything I buy. Um, I pay 52% tax margin on everything I earn. And I pay 40% death duty. Explain to me why I should invest. And I could see, and it was just an interesting, and that's when I think they decided to drop the top rate from 50, effectively 52, down to 45. So it was just an interesting way that uh, people think. Uh, now, so, and, and I think now part of that was done because these guys don't have sophisticated tax planning or whatever. You, you, you know, they're just trying to get on with it. Why would they take the risk? And one of the things we're seeing in the UK, by the way, on that, at the bank, we keep talking about lending to SMEs. Good SMEs are depositing, they're not borrowing. At Barclays, we have far more deposits from SMEs than we have lending because they don't yet have the confidence or the feeling that the return is yet there to invest. That's what we've got to encourage. I think it may be on the cusp of turning. But some really interesting issues here around when people see the risk, reward, confidence to invest. Now, turning to Japan, you know, I, to me, and actually Germany is, is really trying to, I mean, the established Mittelstand are fantastic. But it's really quite difficult to start up a company in Germany. You know, that's one of the things that, that really needs to be done. Because if you're young, you, you know, and I worked in Germany, you, you know, the, 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 the bureaucracy, the cost, the advanced taxes, it's a nightmare. So I don't know the system in Japan enough to really say. But there are a lot of small companies in Japan, too. There's a very complex distribution system. And I think when you want to create employment, you know, employment comes best through SMEs down the supply chain. You know, and that's always worth encouraging, you know. Thank you very much. Now, we've, we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. I found that a very interesting discussion, particularly, um, well, all of your points really, but uh, defence of Britain's role in the EU and uh, immigration and how that pertains to Japan and um, Japan's future. So we thank you, um, Sir Michael, for a very interesting speech and it's tradition here... Um, for our visitors to receive a one-year complimentary membership. So um, if you're back in Japan within a year, actually, yes, we'll, we'll welcome you here at the Thank club. You. Thank you Thank very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Thanks. great. Very interesting. I should... There's my card too, by yeah, the way. Um, okay. English version. If you're in Australia... Uh, I'm going to...